Guys, here it is clearly taught. If you are a member of the new covenant, you are by definition regenerate. This is a very, very important topic. A lot of people wonder why I'm a Baptist. For what it's worth, I have a Presbyterian background in terms of the seminary I go to. And ultimately, I, have a, I share a lot in common with Presbyterians, right? But they believe differently than me when it comes to the topic of the new covenant and when it comes to the topic of baptism. Presbyterians baptize infants, whereas I, as a Baptist, believe that baptism is meant specifically for believers, right? I believe in believers baptism, that baptism is meant for those who have truly repented of their sins and put their faith in Jesus Christ. Okay. So that's the big distinction there. Now here's where I want to go on this topic. I want to go to Jeremiah 31. This is the new covenant. Okay. This is the new covenant that's promised by God and what he essentially says is going to happen in it. Now, we're just going to read parts of this, but ultimately we're going to trace this from the new covenant into the book of Hebrews because Hebrews picks up these passages as well. At that time, declares the Lord, I will be the God of all the families of Israel and they will be my people. This is what the Lord says. The people who survived the sword will find favor in the wilderness. I will come to give rest to Israel. The Lord appeared to us in the past saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. I will build you up again and you, virgin Israel, will be rebuilt. Again, you will bring up your tambrels and you will dance with the joyful. Again, you will plant vineyards on the hills of Samaria. The farmers will plant them and enjoy their fruit. There will be a day when watchmen cry out on the hills of Ephraim. Come, let us go to Zion, to the Lord our God. This is what the Lord says. Sing with joy for Jacob. Shout for the foremost of the nations. Make your praises heard and say, Lord, save your people, the remnant from Israel. See, I will bring them from the land of the north and gather them from the ends of the earth. Among them will be the blind and the lame, expectant mothers and women in labor. A great throng will return. They will come with weeping and I will pray as I bring them back. I will lead them beside streams of waters on a level path where they will not stumble because I am Israel's father and Ephraim is my firstborn. Hear the word of the Lord, you nations. Proclaim it in distant coastlands. He who scattered Israel will gather them and will watch over his flock like a shepherd. For the Lord will deliver Jacob and redeem them from the hand of those who are stronger than they. They will come and shout for joy on the heights of Zion. They will rejoice in the bounty of the Lord, the grain, the new wine, and the olive oil, the young of the flocks and the herds. They will be like a well-watered garden. They will sorrow no more. Then young women will dance and be glad, young men and old as well. I will turn their mourning into gladness. I will give them comfort and joy instead of sorrow. I will satisfy the priests with abundance, and my people will be filled with my bounty, declares the Lord. And, and it continues, guys. This is a statement of the new covenant. This is a statement of what God is going to do in the new covenant, okay? And he continues on and on. We, we could go more and more and more. I'm not going to go into all of the details here, but... Um, my hearts yearn for them. I have compassion for them, declares the Lord. How long will you water, um, wander, daughter of Israel? The Lord will create a new thing on the earth. The woman will return to the man, and on and on it goes. It's talking about the new covenant, okay? And I want to skip down here now to verse 31. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and, I, and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with my people of Israel after that time. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God. They will be my people. No longer will they teach one another the, to their neighbors saying, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least to the greatest. I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. It's a fantastic, fantastic passage. Now, there's a reason that I go to this passage. This is the description of the new covenant. And I am convinced that the difference between, say, a Baptist and a Presbyterian has more to do with how much of the new covenant is new and how much of the new covenant is old than it has to do with any specific passages on baptism. A lot of people on this subject or topic of Pado versus credo baptism like to run to a lot of, you know, Old Testament passages that um, seem to indicate different methods or modes. They like to run to New Testament passages. Look, he was dunked in the water. He wasn't just sprinkled. Look, here's a passage that demonstrates that, you know, um, he was baptized after being saved. Or here's a passage where it demonstrates his whole household was baptized. That's where a, love, a bunch of people love to run to on these passages, okay? 
on these doctrines. But ultimately, I don't think that's where the difference lies. I don't think that's where the primary issue is when it comes to Baptist versus Presbyterian or Credo Baptist versus Pado Baptist. Instead, I believe the question primarily lies with this. How much of the new covenant is new and how much of the new covenant is old? And here's where I ultimately want to run. I want to run to the sign of the new covenant. The sign of the new covenant is baptism. For Presbyterians, this sign mimics or mirrors a sign from the old covenant. And that old covenant sign is circumcision. So for Presbyterians... In the New Covenant, baptism is the fulfillment of the Old Testament sign of circumcision. We circumcised our children in the Old Covenant, therefore we should baptize our children in the New Covenant. That's the idea, okay? So, when you go from Old Covenant to New Covenant, the Old Covenant sign of circumcision is changed into the New Covenant sign of baptism, okay? And it applied to children in the Old Covenant, therefore it should apply to children in the New Covenant. That's the Presbyterian argument. Now, what I want you guys to know is that I don't follow that entire line of argument because I think there is a change between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, specifically when it comes to its covenant members and their status before God. Now, we read Jeremiah 31 already. Let's go to Hebrews 8, where the writer of the book of Hebrews applies Jeremiah 31 to the New Covenant. Pa Panda asks, what is the New Covenant? The New Covenant is the covenant that Jesus establishes with his people through his blood, right? Jesus comes and he establishes the New Covenant with the bread and the wine, and that is ultimately the covenant, the New Covenant in his blood. And it's ultimately that people will come to him from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation, okay? So that's the idea. Now, let me read Hebrews 8 to you, because this passage is why I'm a Baptist, okay? Now, the main point of what we are saying is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by a mere human being, okay? Every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices, and so it was necessary for this one also to have something to offer. If he were on earth, he would not be a priest, for there are already priests who offer gifts prescribed by the law. And he kind of talks about how Jesus is a new priest, right? Who's implementing a new covenant, right? But in fact, the ministry Jesus has received is a superior one to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one. Since the new covenant is established on better promises. You hear that? The new covenant, guys, is established on better promises. It's better than the old covenant. That is where the new covenant is established. It's established on better promises than the old covenant. All right, verse seven. For if there had been nothing wrong with that first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with it and the people and said, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel, with the people of Judah. Does the language sound familiar? It's identical to the language of Jeremiah 31. The author of Hebrews is bringing up Jeremiah 31's covenant and putting it right here and saying, ultimately, Jesus has established this new covenant. It's a better covenant. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they did not remain too faithful to my covenant and turned away from them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will establish with this the people the of Israel. Big Here's what's being implemented. A new covenant, says the Bible. God is implementing a new covenant. It's not going to be like the covenant he made with Israel. There's going to be some major differences. Now, why? Why is it going to be different in one sense? Because they did not remain faithful to his covenant. See, here was the problem with the old covenant. God gave his rules, his you. principles, his ideas. God gave his standards to his people in the old covenant, but they didn't follow in it. They didn't continue on in the covenant. Instead, they fell away. And why? Why did they fall away? Because their sinful flesh and hearts were fallen. Ultimately, they need a savior, a redeemer. They needed regeneration by the power of the Holy Spirit. What the author is saying here is the problem with the old covenant is that none of it, not all of its members were regenerate. That was the problem with the old covenant. Why? They did not remain faithful to my covenant, and I returned away from them, declares the Lord. The problem with the old covenant is that not all of its members are regenerate. This is going to be important. Here's the new covenant he establishes. This is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel at that time, declares the Lord. 
I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. What is he talking about? He's talking about regeneration. He's talking about taking out the heart of stone and giving the heart of flesh. He's talking about the new birth. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord. They're no longer going to have to tell each other, hey, you need to know the Lord. Why? Because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. They're all going to know me from the least to the greatest. Every member of the new covenant knows God. That's what he's saying. No longer will they teach their neighbor one another saying, know the Lord. They will all know me from the least to the greatest. I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. What is obsolete is outdated and will soon disappear. What he's showing or demonstrating is that this new covenant is right here. The old covenant is obsolete, it's outdated, and it's soon going to disappear. And what was the problem with the old covenant? Not all of its members were regenerate. And what is God going to do in the new covenant? I am going to regenerate every member of the new covenant. I will put my laws in their minds and I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God. They will be my people. They will no longer teach one another their neighbor saying, know the Lord. They're all going to know me from the least to the greatest. I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. The covenant marker of the new covenant is not circumcision turned into baptism. The covenant marker of the new covenant is regeneration. The covenant marker of the new covenant is that God takes out your heart of stone and gives you a heart of flesh. The covenant marker of the new covenant is... Being born again. What Jesus talked about in John chapter 3 when he told Nicodemus, you must be born again or you won't even see the kingdom of heaven. That's the covenant marker in the new covenant. Circumcision in the Old Testament, the New Testament fulfillment of circumcision is not baptism. It is circumcision of the heart. Regeneration. And if the new covenant marker is regeneration, if it is circumcision of the heart, that God is taking out your heart of stone and giving you a heart of flesh, that he is causing you to be born again, then what that means, the implications of that, are that in the new covenant, all of its members are regenerate. They're all saved. They've all had their heart of stone taken out and given a heart of flesh. That's the key idea. I've got a reading right here that I love. This is from D.A. Carson, okay? D.A. Carson says this, it appears that a great deal of the debate over assurance, he was talking about assurance, but listen to what he says, has been controlled by forensic categories associated with justification and faith, but has largely ignored the categories of power and transformation associated with the spirit and new covenant. A fundamental component of such themes is that the people of the new covenant are by definition granted a new heart and empowered by the spirit to walk in holiness. Do you hear that, guys? A fundamental component of such themes is that the people of the new covenant are by definition granted a new heart and empowered by the spirit to walk in holiness. By definition. If you're a member of the new covenant, you have been regenerated. Your heart of stone has been taken out. You've been given a heart of flesh. You have been born again. That's definitional to being a member of the new covenant. To love righteousness, to prove pleasing to the Lord. This means that insofar as the writers of the New Testament thought of themselves as new covenant heirs, they could not think of themselves as other than spirit endowed, regenerate, transformed. The New Testament does not preserve the old covenant distinction between the locus of the covenant community and the locus of the remnant, or between the locus of the covenant community and the locus of the leaders on whom special endowment had fallen. It is of the essence of the new covenant that those who are in it, who have been given a new heart, have been cleansed and have received the Holy Spirit. Moreover, this theme cannot rightly be divorced from the entailments of justification and of salvation through faith. The gift of the Spirit is tied to justification, salvation by grace through faith, not by works so that no one can boast, is tied to the fact that we are God's works, workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. End quote. Guys, here it is clearly taught, and I agree with D.A. Carson at this point, that if you are a member of the New Covenant, you are by definition regenerate. And ultimately, that is why I'm a Baptist. I'm not a Baptist because this passage looks like immersion, and this one looks like only believers are baptized or anything like that. I'm a Baptist because, by definition, members of the New Covenant are regenerate, and so the covenant signs should be given to regenerate covenant members. Now, I know the arguments from my Presbyterian friends because I brought this up to one of my professors. And he said that that's an overrealized eschatology. That ultimately what we are reading in Jeremiah 31, what we are reading in Hebrews 8, has to do with the new heavens and new earth. It doesn't have to do with the here and now. 
But I just fundamentally disagree. The author of Hebrews writes in Hebrews 8, by calling this covenant new, he's made the first one obsolete. It's outdated and will soon disappear. And I do not think he means thousands of years later after Christ returns. Instead, I think he means it's happening right now. The old covenant is disappearing and the new covenant is taking its place. And ultimately, all the members of the new covenant are regenerate by the power of the Holy Spirit, which means that we should administer the covenant signs of the Lord's Supper and baptism only to members of the new covenant, i.e. those who are regenerate by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so that is why I'm a Baptist. All right. Hey guys, Pastor Chandler here. If you enjoyed that content, would you please consider hitting the like and subscribe button for us? It really helps us out. Also, if you want to check out the description, we've got links to our Twitch and our Discord. Take care. God bless. Bye now.